This meeting is called to order. You're going to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Pledge I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Commissioner Harper Pedersen and Commissioner Divney are excused. Commissioner San Filippo? Present. Vice Chair Marsters? Present. Chair Clapper? Present. I knew that. <laughs> Public comment? Public comment is limited to items not on the agenda. The Commission may briefly respond to the statements made or questions posed as allowed by the Brown Act. Government Code Section 54954.2. However, the Commission's general policy is to refer items to staff for attention or have a matter placed on a future Commission agenda for a more comprehensive action or report. Okay. So the three requests I have to speak have to do with what's on the agenda. Is there anyone here who has a public comment that is not on the agenda? No. Okay, seeing none, we'll move forward to the approval of minutes. This is for August 15th, 2011. I was not at that meeting. Do either of you have any comment or corrections on the minutes? I have no comments. I move approval of the August 15th, 2011 Planning Commission minutes. I second it. <clears throat> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And then I, I will abstain since I wasn't present at the meeting. New business. Consideration of a request pursuant to San Carlos Municipal Code Section 17.28.010 to grant an extension of time for filing a final parcel map at 1525 Cherry and 700 Chestnut Streets in San Carlos. APNs 050-14140 and 370-360. and Staff report, please. Yes, Deborah Nelson, planning manager. This is, uh, you've seen this project a number of times, at least the planning commission has, and it is a 34 unit condominium complex, sort of caddy corner across from the library, approved a number of years ago for 34 um, condominium units in a four story building. And due to the economic climate, it has not been able to move forward with the final parcel map. Um, so the applicant is asking for an extension of that map to September 12th, 2013. The case law supports this and it is consistent with what you, um, the Planning Commission did a number of years ago and what we have been recommending with other projects. So, um, Regarding this, we recommend that you take a motion as on um, illustrated on the projector. And that is to extend the uh, final parcel map for the Cherry Chestnut project <coughs> to September 12, 2013. Uh, 2012-2013. I have one quick question on sure. this, and that is um, we're extending it for one year, but one year would be September 12, 2012. And so there's, yeah, there's that a. Is, uh, that is true. There seems to be a disconnect here because the applicant was actually asking for a one year extension. And not that I have a problem with going out to 2013, I just wanted to know if that was really accurate and whether we want to go to 2013 or we want yeah, to this, go to Yeah, um, this, my guess is that's an error on our well, Do we have a requirement? Part. Can we go beyond a year? We a could for the first, the first time as it was extended, you can extend for two years. Then the code that's says one, one year. year thereafter. So okay. thank you for that. I, I'm guessing that's an error on our part. Any other questions? Very familiar with this project. Okay. <laughs> Need to make so a motion. What, yeah. I'll move it and 
correct the date. Um, I move that the Planning Commission approve the request of Mr. Dan Rothinghaus mm -hmm. to extend the approval date to a file a final parcel map associated with the construction of 1525 Cherry and 700 Chestnut Streets, San Carlos, APN 0501410400. Zero f and zero five zero one four one three seven zero and zero five zero one four one three six zero for a period of one year with an expiration date of September 12, 2012, and that the tentative parcel map certificate approved August 16, 2010, shall be amended to include, as shown in bold type and underlined on the tentative parcel map certificate extended to September 12, 2012 by the Planning Commission on September 19, 2011. I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Passed unanimously. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda is public hearing. Procedure for the public hearing. Staff will present a report on the history, physical features, and on the application followed with the staff's recommendations. The applicant will make a presentation. Thereafter, interested members of the community may speak on the proposal. When all interested parties have had an opportunity to be heard, the hearing will be closed and no further discussion from the floor can be held. The commission will then consider the evidence and make its recommendation. If you challenge a public hearing item in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at the public hearing described in this notice. The public notice or in written correspondence delivered to the city at or prior to the public hearing. Speakers should fill out a speaker form found by the door and hand it to the recording secretary prior to addressing the commission. The speaker should come up to the microphone to speak since the meeting is being recorded. This will assist staff in preparing the minutes. And presently I have uh, three requests to speak. So if there's anyone else who would like to speak, if you could please complete a form or later in this discussion. Okay, um, and now staff report. Good evening. My name is Gavin Monahan, and I will be taking you through the application tonight for a proposed new home at 151 Coronado. The request tonight is for a conditional use permit a grading per permit and a dirt hall permit and a subsequent architectural review. The entitlement documents would be the grading and dirt hall permit, uh, the grading permit and the dirt hall permit and the conditional use permit. The site is uh, currently zoned plan community. It's PC 1283. It's surrounded by single family uses and the majority of the homes in this area are independently zoned, there's just R1, there's not a PC overlay. The plan community, as you may be aware, is used in areas uh, like this or the prospect project that was before you a year or so ago um, to address significant site constraints by allowing uh, a unique set of building parameters to be proposed for the site um, in order to address uh, challenging site constraints or unique situations. So previously this had been uh, zoned PC 1283. There are three lots here, and two of them were zoned uh, were before the Planning Commission together, lots 40, 147 and 151, and they were previously approved by with one owner. They had underlying ownership of uh, one particular entity, and they came before the Planning Commission with a design that was able to propose a shared driveway. The driveway entered through 147 and then terminated at 151. Uh, the lots are no longer, they're now independently owned, they're no longer owned by one entity. And so the individual designs and the, the proposals for single family homes will come independently before you uh, with a request of having independent driveways. It's a little bit of the background and history. I'll probably give you a little bit more history a little later in the presentation. And again, it's there, this area is surrounded by single family homes. If you can see my cursor here, these are the lots that have not been developed. There's three of them here. And the outline of this is general uh, reference to the area of the proposal tonight. So the project request is for a conditional use permit to allow a 4,946 square foot home, uh, a semi-detached garage, and a pool. Um, additionally, they're requesting a grading permit and a dirt hall permit, 
which is required under our code for any grading quantities that are larger than 1,000 cubic yards. And for this particular proposal, there is a grading request for 2,530 cubic yards. All new homes are subject to architectural review. Uh, it's usually the purview of our residential design review committee, but when grading exceeds 1,000 cubic yards, the municipal code states that they need approval of a grading permit and a dirt hall permit. Uh, and once that happens, it is referenced to the planning commission for that approval. And then we ref make all um, approvals for this type of entitlement package together. So you will be also be doing the architectural review tonight. Um, and that is actually uh, captured under the conditional use permit. The conditional use permit, the plan, plan community, which is the overlay zoning, has underneath it a conditional use permit. That's the document, <coughs> that's, the, that's the, the, the facts and figures document that comes forward with a description of the home and setbacks. Uh, conditions, requirements, specifics from the building department, public works department, um, and then any special conditions from planning, fire, public, or public works, uh, police, uh, and the fire department. Those all come on the conditional use permit. The conditional use permit that was or, uh, originally approved for this lot has expired. It would have had to have been constructed within the, uh, two years of approval. So it is timed out. And in order for there to be construction on this lot, we'll look at just this lot tonight, uh, a new conditional use permit must be approved. That is why it's in front of you tonight. Um, as we've been doing in the, for the past two or three years, we did send the design of this through RDRC. We had a study session for it on August 15th to solicit feedback from the neighbors. It's a, a great forum um, to get uh, input. Uh, the design review committee is, is very comfortable and skilled at reviewing single family homes, so it's quite appropriate to send it through them first. Uh, but we just do that as a study session and then with their recommendation uh, that it would go forward with a positive recommendation to the Planning Commission. And that was uh, completed on August 15th. The conditional use permit that's associated with this request would allow, there's several things, I mean there's multiple things that's changing because there's a different home plan in front of you. Um, but there are some, the larger items we pulled out and put in the staff report as bullets and then they're also up here uh, that the proposed new height of the house would be at an elevation of 420 feet 10 inches which is four feet below the lowest grade elevation at 41 Elston Court if you look at your large size plans and you look at the lot at the look facing the lot on the north north east corner the lower section of the top part of the lot there's lines of contour that are labeled with elevations on them and then that corresponds with the ridge height the tallest part of the house so on that particular plan set the tallest part of this house at Ridge is four feet below the lowest grade elevation of the lot behind it. So this is on purpose. This is intended so that there would not be a view blockage because we do have considerations for uh, significant views of the San Francisco Bay or the Western Hills. So on applications in this type of neighborhood where there are significant views, it's very important that the homes don't create a significant view impact. Doesn't mean that they can't create some impact. The code is not written to be exclusive of any impact. It just says that significant views um, shall be considered. So that's the first one. The second is that the proposal has been um, modified featuring the separate driveway. The, you'll see on the plans that because the lots are so steep, it's very difficult to get driveways in. And the, the cut design to bring the, the uh, residents into both lots through 47 allowed for a lower driveway angle uh, and less, you know, more tapering of the driveway. Um, and there, it's a little more efficient to have one driveway for two homes. Um, having said that, we don't generally recommend that. Planning staff, we've had numerous um, problems with shared driveways. They're not always, uh, they may be efficient, but they're not always the best way to get two or three uh, families out of their single family homes. And you can imagine any number of things that come up as a result of the shared driveway. So in this case, the applicants, we didn't recommend either or, the applicants came forth with their own design plan and wanted an independent driveway to the house. The setback of this garage uh, and this home in general has been moved from the standard requirement of this height of house from 19 feet uh, front setback to approximately one foot from the property line in order to accommodate an individual driveway and also to re reduce the height of the house. So on these stacked houses that go up on a hillside, um, some of the successful ones are designed like a set of stairs and each level up goes up and then over and then up and over. So at any given time, the homes are less than 28 feet, our maximum height, um, or stepped into the hillside. Uh, if you go straight up and your architectural program is colonial or neo-traditional as this house is, where you want to see a facade with two full floors and the pony wall below, you can get to 28 or 30 or 35 or 40 feet very quickly. It's very difficult because of the steepness of the lot. Uh, the first iterations of this home came out with the garage connected to the home and it was above our maximum height 
limit for single family houses. So planning staff recommended uh, a variety of things. The applicants chose a particular architectural style. They wanted to come forth with it. We had um, discussed a variety of ways for them to address the height, like a, a stair step style home or a different type of architectural plan. But they were uh, dedicated to a particular architectural style. And in order to achieve that, a recommendation was made to cleave the garage from the house so that instead of having one big structure, you have two smaller structures. So the garage was brought forward a minimum of six feet away from the home, which was recommended uh, for detached buildings. But I call it semi-attached or semi-detached, depending on how you look at it, because on the, uh, as you enter that section of the garage, it's connected through basically a subterranean access into the main part of the house. And the house has four levels. So again, detaching the garage did a number of things. One is it kept the height of the house down as we measure height to be below 28 feet. Um, two, it pushing the garage, the closer you get a garage on a hillside of Coronado or any of those streets, Madera um, uh, or Fay, the closer you get the garage to the uphill side of the street's property line, the less grading you have to do. If you put it up 19 feet, you may be up 10 feet already in elevation or eight or 10 feet in elevation. So it increases the amount of uh, grade, the steepness of the driveway, which is limited by public works, and it also greatly increases the amount of grading. So it's really a challenge. You have a house that's going to need a certain amount of grading, and uh, sometimes it takes more grading to recess the garage in so they can actually approach it with an angle that's uh, approved by public works. Um, but at the same time, if you push the garage back and stick it up out of the hill, then it may create a, a view issue, um, and it would also create a very steep driveway, which would be difficult um, to have approved if, if even. So that's the third main point that I want to bring up. And then the size of the home has increased from 3,013 square feet under the 2,000 uh, approval to 4,946 square feet under the current proposal. There's a lot to cover tonight, so I'm happy to stop if you have questions midstream or we can just bookmark it and I can come back. So I want to talk a little just at this point because I've mentioned the square footage of the home. Um, and that has been a concern during outreach to some of the neighbors. So one of the questions that I had for the applicants uh, after reviewing the house is looking at the house's bulk and mass. How, how are they achieving a reduction in bulk and mass? How is it going to fit within our findings uh, through design review and also for the, the conditional use permit and our architectural requirements for single family homes? So as I mentioned before, the, the lot is very steep and the house is quite significantly tucked into the hillside. So I asked the applicant to provide some numbers. I had done some preliminary calculations of what percent of the home or what in this case square footage of the home was at grade I mean below grade or essentially underground um, and the numbers that uh, the applicant provided in my scaling comes up with something very similar was 1838 square feet of the uh, proposal of the house is either below grade or underground and it's just a matter of point because you are approving a home that is 4,900 square feet but I thought it was important to bring up that 1,800 of it is uh, submerged underground. It actually brings the total square footage of the house to within about 100 square feet of the original approval. Uh, a little bit more on that, because it's a four-level home, a lot of that square footage is dedicated to circulation. You enter and you go upstairs. There's also an elevator, which was a request of the, of the applicants uh, with a four-level home. You could imagine that uh, as years go by, it would be appropriate or uh, convenient for certain to have an elevator in the house. So the multiple landings and the elevator, the internal stairs, and then the connection between the garage and the main home do create quite a bit of square footage. They don't make up the full difference between the original approval and the proposal. But they do create quite a bit of additional square footage. So part of your uh, um, entitlement review tonight is for architectural review. We have here the site plan. I scanned it from a reduced size set of plans, so forgive me if it's blurry. This is the main residence here, which is outlined by the four corners of the cursor. And this is what we've referenced as a semi-detached garage, because it does have this basically underground breezeway um, that connects the house that applicants refer to it as the tunnel uh, between the studio garage and the main residence. There is a retaining wall that is featured along the front of the home. It's all of the uphill homes on, on uh, all of our uphill homes in San Carlos have retaining walls to keep back um, the grade from encroaching on the driveway. In this case, the original iteration showed quite significant high walls, which we have concerns with because retaining walls are not particularly aesthetic. So through revisions to the original plans, um, and we'll see that later on, there's a set of staggered step backs for the retaining wall allowing planting um, with the intention that uh, that would be planted with um, materials that will grow, help soften the wall, creep, climb, um, and help block the overall appearance of a large monolithic wall. You can actually add some um, structural benefits too by having the walls um, staggered back. 
but in this case it was mostly for aesthetic purposes. The lot is um, approximately 12,000 square feet in size. This is Elston Court up here at the top of the picture. Previous to the review tonight, this was many years ago, I think probably more than two decades ago, a private easement was granted <coughs> to the uphill neighbors as a 28-foot easement. So actually all of this section here outlined by the cursor is the property of um, the applicants. It's part of 151 Coronado. But it's for the exclusive use of the uphill neighbors and they have it planted already. It's, it's planted and it's fenced. Excuse me, um, Gavin, is that, yeah. is that 12,000, excuse me, is that little strip this part of the 12,000? Yeah, we, now that, that's a great question. We actually, for review of a house, if it has an easement, we count the total square footage of the lot. Because you could imagine you could have a house that has a public utility easement and a, and a storm drain easement and a sewer easement and several easements on it. And so we don't do a reduction of um, square footage for the lot based on easements. Um, and we also don't base a setback on an easement. So in this case, you'll notice that the house in the rear is, is set back a greater distance than it's required, but the setback is to the property line, not to the easement. So a home could be built within a couple inches of an easement. That's perfectly legal. So, and that's what you're seeing in this case here. If you looked at the Google Earth images or some of the, the picture in the staff report, um, you'll see that the landscaping conforms to the shape of the, the house above it, um, not to the property line of 151 Coronado. And it's my understanding after talking to a couple of the residents on Elston that that was intended on purpose with the original property owners at 147, 151 in order to ensure privacy view issues. I mean, if you have 28 feet of the top of a person's property and actually top and rolling down the lines of contour, um, it helps ensure that you're not gonna have anything built there because you have a private um, exclusive no build easement. So that's what's going on with this lot here on, the, on this particular site plan. And then the studio garage is pushed forward. The property line runs within about a foot of the proposed garage. Originally, the garage overhung the property line with some architectural embellishments, which is not allowed. Um, you're allowed to build at the property line in several different zoning districts, like Laurel Street, for instance, and El Camino, but you're not allowed to build over the property line, even with a cantilever. It takes uh, public works approval, and we don't allow it in San Carlos. So the home was, the garage was modified, uh, eaves and um, bay window design uh, in the front of it were modified so that the structure would be behind the front property line. It's about a foot, plus or minus. There is quite a, uh, Coronado is a pretty narrow street here, as you will all aware if you've driven it before. So the section of space between the improvement, the asphalt, and where the home is proposed is right away. It's public right away. It's owned by the city of San Carlos. Uh, there is no intention of widening Coronado at this point. Um, and so what you'll see here, kind of where I'm doing, I'm pushing the cursor, is uh, an area that's gonna be planted by the applicant. It will be in the city's right of way. It requires an encroachment permit through public works. They're, they're granted on a da basically daily basis to do work on fences and driveways and plantings in the right of way. Um, and that's to the benefit of the neighborhood and also the house to help soften the garage element by having uh, permanent trees and shrubbery in front of the garage. That's a little bit about the site plan. There's also a proposed pool for the back here, a lap pool. There are some significant trees. The trees on this section, uh, of the lot are proposed to stay. There are two trees that are heritage size that are in the path of construction and because of the site constraints of this lot, it, it would be nearly impossible, if not impossible, to build a new home around the two existing trees because they're, they're really right in the path of, the, of construction for any proposal, whether it's this house or a, a, a different iteration. This is the front elevation. I have a better one coming up next. It, the, um, our scanner did not like this particular uh, line of graphic artwork. So I'll look at this picture here, then we can go back to the front elevation. The applicants wanted this neo-traditional style house. It has some kind of colonial influences. It's a square rectilinear house. Um, it's, it's very symmetrical. It's not totally symmetrical, but it's pr pretty symmetrical on both sides. Um, and the top floor, because of this architectural style, needs to line up with the bottom floor. When you put that on this particular uh, incline, uh, and then add the required pony wall underneath and then connect it to a garage. Uh, the original iteration, the home was nearly 50 feet tall. So what you see now is a home that has a garage unit that's above 20 feet, separated by this area that's actually planted uh, with landscaping. The tunnel goes through this section here and then measuring from the landscape planter here to the top of the gable here or from the ridge above to the grade below it keeps this house under our maximum 20, uh, of 28 feet. It also reduces the, 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 the bulk of the house from its original iterations. So this is that, just another view of the house. These first and second floor planes are all lined up. And this is the garage here. This is the side elevation. This is the east elevation. 
This is just a, a cutaway. It doesn't show the house below grade. On the right-hand side, you'll see the main structure, and you're seeing a floor and a half, or a floor and a quarter, I guess it's about a floor and a half. And there are two additional floors below it. So there is a floor that's level with the garage here where you pull in underneath here. So there's actually construction back to about here. The next image is the west elevation. And this shows a set of stairs on the side of the house and then access to the back. So just to, again to, to reiterate, it's four levels. There isn't a window because of the steepness of the, of the terrain. There isn't a window on the house to the rear until the fourth floor. So, you know, some of the questions and recommendations by uh, residents and even planning staff originally was can you knock it down from three levels to, to or from four levels to three and you could but you'd have a house that didn't have any windows uh, to the rear just to the sides and the front and at that point just a relatively small window here this is the rear elevation and at this point it's a it appears to be a one-story house it is not it has four levels but from the rear looking down from Elston Court it would be, appear to be at grade uh, one level house Oops. So I'm going to put it in a little bit of neighborhood context here. The lines here on the um, downhill side of Coronado, this is the actual property line. As you can see, it literally follows the contours of the homes that were built on the downhill side. Some of the homes are actually built in a curvilinear fashion to meet the property line. And this is the development pattern of the street. In, in, it, um, as planners, we look at several different things, and one of them sometimes is, or one of them oftentimes is, the, the existing development pattern, the standing development pattern, um, is, it, is it unique or is it greater than or less than? Is it, there's something that's unique about it um, when looking at approving things or finding um, or making findings, I should say, for approval. So in this case, Coronado is very unique. There's only, I don't know, a handful or so streets in San Carlos where homes are built right on the property line. Um, and on, uh, beyond that, these homes have significant infrastructure um, uh, in the, in the public right-of-way, they have basically a drawbridge. Most of these homes have bridges that connect you from the street grade to the garage, and uh, at least these homes in here, the garage can be 15 or 20 feet from the back of the garage to the grade below, or, 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 or steeper because of the, the incline of the hill at this point. The homes here, um, I think quite frankly, have not been built, these three empty lots, because it's such a challenging site. There have been several iterations over the last 30 plus years for these particular lots. Um, and for whatever reason, they have not been completed, even um, going through an entitlement process and have not been constructed because there are significant challenges with the site. The applicant, the homeowner, um, the applicant architect and the homeowners were well aware of that. When they tackled this, we met with them a couple of times and, and uh, shared with them the, the design constraints and the building constraints that we understood existed on this particular street for these three lots. The uh, uphill lots on this section of Coronado are not quite as steep. This is fairly steep here, um, and it has a side driveway, and same with this here. There are about f four or five houses on this section of Coronado that share lesser front setbacks than we would require, and they range from 5 to 15 feet. And there are uphill houses on Coronado that have, their, uh, have achieved a minimum, their minimum setback of 19 feet. So I just would like to point that out. That was mentioned by uh, some of the residents that these people were able to build 19 feet back from the uh, uh, end of the public right-of-way. Um, why doesn't the applicant consider the same for their property? But there are differences, significant differences in the topography of the houses on either side of Coronado. So as a result of building on a hillside and having concerns with view impacts, um, there was also a concern raised by one of the neighbors about shadowing, concerns that a new home would cast shadows on his property, on their property. Uh, as a result, without um, uh, really any requirement from planning staff, the applicants created both um, view and shadow impact studies. There's large versions of these in your plans, and I apologize, they don't, it's impossible to scan them and put them on PowerPoint uh, and to do them justice. Uh, the applicant, or the architect's here tonight, and I will have him walk through it, he's quite versed at explaining this, but they basically occur from about 8 in the morning until 2 in the afternoon. These are the times where you're concerned with a shade and shadow. Of course, in the nighttime, it's not such a concern. There's also uh, different times of the year that basically the four seasons are captured here. In the summertime, when the sun is high, there's less of an issue. When the sun's low in the wintertime, there's less of an issue. And because of the topography of Coronado, there's actually times in the year where the hillside creates its own shadow. So any of the structures built below the ridge line um, that would be created by Elston create little or no impact to the houses below because, it's, uh, because of the steepness of the terrain there. 
So I will have him go over that. Um, and we can also, if you have specific questions about that, open up the full-size plans and go through them either by date or time um, or by address if, you're, if you have questions or concerns about so, them. So, they, so we did all, I, I was, that's what I was looking for. I sure. saw December, but I can't. Were there all four seasons represented? I don't remember now. Yeah, I think it's like the 22nd of basically December. the season, September. Yeah, yeah. okay. I'm December, sure. yeah. All right. And that's just to capture, you know, a snapshot in time of sure. what could occur. Uh, there were concerns that the shadow study wasn't accurate. And so Mr. McMillan, the architect, also created um, images of a no-build. So this is the shade and shadow that occurs without any house, without any homes on the three lots on the uphill side of Coronado. Um, and as a result, you can see in certain seasons there's a significant shadow created with a no-build project, which is the natural hillside left in place. So when you look from the, where it looks like it's at one grade, was that the north side? Let me think here. That would be looking. Heat from, that, from the street above? Yes. How high is it at that point? The house? Yeah, just a normal size house with the gable. Yeah, I think it's about, I would say there's a eight or 10 foot plate height there and then there's a relatively low roof height. They dropped their pitch originally. Um, and I could have Mr. McMillan tell you which pitch it started at and where it ended, but it was dropped from eight and 12 or, six and 12 to a lower pitch to help reduce the height of the house. I'm happy to scale it. Once I sit down, if you want, I, I can key the mic and tell you exactly how tall it is, but I think it's somewhere in the range of 14 to 16 feet. It's kind of a standard one-story house at that point. Well, that's what it looks like, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the last of these is the, um, the view impact. Uh, a study was done from three different addresses. Uh, the addresses that would be impacted. There's two uphill addresses on Elston and then one lower neighbor that would be impacted because of the close proximity of construction. Um, and those are also in your packet. Uh, and those show uh, actual images taken from those locations looking either towards the project site or downhill over the project site if you're considering uh, the section of Elston Court. So in the staff report there are um, you will see some um, common set of findings that we have. There are four that we use for RDRC, and they're pursuant to section 18104.085. And these are uh, an amalgamation of the requirements and uh, designs, design and conditions required for under design review. And they have been assembled as we use for RDRC into to, to subject headings with um, the requirement and then the finding below. Those are for our design review. The conditional use permit has um, in it two additional findings. The first is that the proposed use of the proposed location would not be detrimental or injurious to persons, property, or improvements in the vicinity, and not detrimental to the public health, peace, safety, comfort, general welfare, or convenience. This is one of the use permit findings. And the second is that the proposed use will be located and conducted in a manner that's in accord with the general plan and the purpose of that plan and of that title. Uh, and, in both and in both situations for the conditional use permit and also the design review findings, staff is able to make that finding with the basis of findings um, that support the requirement. There's one required finding for grading permit and a dirt hall permit, um, and that's that the proposed grading would not adversely affect the drainage or lateral support of properties in the area and would not be detrimental to the public health and safety and general welfare. So those are the findings that are required uh, for you to make tonight in order to um, entitle the request of the applicants. I am available for questions. I'm gonna put up our um, recommendations. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission approve the request of Alex and Natasha Chernukin for the construction of a new 4,946 square foot single family residence at 151 Coronado. Assessor's parcel number is 04914620 with associated conditional use permit and a grading permit and dirt hall permit approval certificate allowing 2,530 cubic yards of grading work based on the findings and for the reasons incorporated in the staff report. And then the following and last slide is uh, the formal motion should you choose to make that tonight. And I'm available for questions. If you have specific questions um, about the staff report, I will stay up here. If you have questions about the view impact study, I'm happy to get out the full size plans and go over it or maybe have you address architect first and then I can um, add in or fill in with anything you have specific to me. All right. So when the, when the when we originally created the PC, 
and they put houses at 3,000 square feet or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. What was the logic at that point to put that number in there? There actually were, um, as you have in front of you tonight, a design plan, you know, a home plan that somebody wanted to do. They're very specific, and that's okay. that's where the conditional use permit approval for single family homes gets tricky because it goes in front of a planning commission. Um, and it gets approved and uh, as you may know there are many changes that go on especially on hillside development people add and subtract square footed footage and change designs and and if the staff report and the uh, conditional use permit say that it's for the set of plans approved you know under review on this certain date it makes it tricky for another person to come in years later and take that home and make modifications and build it and that's I believe the case that happened this was uh, more than a decade ago so that's the, the, the story as I understand it um, that that applicant did not wish to come forward at that time or wasn't able to financially. So that approved set of home plans is maybe something that's dated to 2000, maybe not something that the current applicant wants to build. So so the, the PC was driven based upon somebody else's plan, so that's why they ended up with a 3,000 square foot house. Yep. The, just that, so, okay, yep. There was no the, other logic involved with it. Yeah, the PC creates this ordinance, this, right. and then the use permits fit underneath it as the, as the, the pieces of the puzzle that legislate the design of the house and the conditions of under how it's built. And when you, uh, so we converted it from 49 to 3,033 and whatever it was, I, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. Um, so it's strictly just, it's what we're assuming to be roughly the area that's being covered on land, not necessarily inland. Correct, yeah. And is there any restrictions as far as inland construction? Oh, you mean like how much coverage? Well, I understand coverage because yeah, it's area, right? So now typically. we're talking about depth. Oh no, there is there isn't. There isn't. There okay, isn't. I didn't I didn't think so, but you know, I don't want to I don't want to um, downplay the square footage request because the home is it will have four thousand nine hundred plus square footed feet of conditioned or semi conditioned space. I'm not sure all the breezeways will be conditioned, but I mean that is truly the request. That's what the most likely the tax records will read for the property. They they usually take the garage out, but. But in essence, the tax records will show a 4,500 square foot house with a two car garage. I mean, that is a request in front of you. I'm looking at it because we have had homes on hillsides where they're built at 15 or 16 or 2,000 square feet and they have this huge space underneath them. And years later, people come in and say, I want to fill in the second level, the third level, whatnot. We used to take them to the design review uh, and the envelope of the home wasn't changing. They may be adding some windows, but they physically were not changing the outside of the house. They were just going to build in these giant crawl spaces, some of them with 20 foot clearances um, and design review and staff uh, in concert decided these were not things that we would take forward because there was really little that design review could comment on a home that already had its envelope the shell was already constructed there's very little comment you're going to make so I only mention that in that this home could have 1800 square feet underground with non-conditioned space that you don't see an exterior stairs going to it I mean that is an option it was an option to discuss can you get to your house through the outside instead of going through the inside so a proposal could come in front of you tonight or any, another night that looks just like this that's only 3,000 square feet because all of that interior space is not used. It's not an elevator. It's not a set of stairs. It's not a breezeway. It's not a storage facility. It's not a furnace room. These are the things that they have underground. So those things could all be removed on a duplicate one lot 147, for instance, could come in front of you tonight and come in at 29 or 3,000 or 3,100 square feet and have the similar appearance. So. It, gets, it does get tricky on hillside development. So you're saying those other parts of the structure would be accommodated within that 3,000 square feet? Well, if another and, home came in. Or it could in, be exterior exactly. to the, the, the envelope. Exactly. I mean, what I'm saying is you could be looking at two homes tonight, and one of them could have a staff request for 3,000 square feet, and one could have one for 4,900 square feet, and they could be the same home. It's just that the applicants of one have decided not to make any of that underground space livable or conditioned. They've strictly said we're going to enter this home from the outside, and there are many homes on Madera um, and Fay, I believe, that you have to enter a steep house or uphill or downhill house through a set of at grade stairs. You park on a pad and you trump down a set of stairs on the ground or up a set of stairs to your home, and there's no connected breezeway, there's no underground, there's no subterranean. So, I just throw it out there because it's something we, we you know, we, we we discuss in planning and we look at to grapple with. So the the, uh, the ordinance twelve eighty three, does that trump the conditional use permit, or can you adjust, can you modify the ordinance in the conditional use permit? So in this case, it's actually and Deborah, correct me if I'm wrong. We're actually replacing 
this is really, uh, we're modifying the use permit, but what is being replaced is the plan of development. So the application of the Cherenukins for this particular home will be um, put in with an updated use permit that has new findings from Public Works, from the Building Department, from, and from planning. So it has what kind of language from Public Works? N new, requ uh, new, not findings, I'm sorry, new conditions. New conditions. That, that are inserted by the reviewing bodies and the, the departments. Because there are conditions in the ordinance that aren't the same Correct. as the yes. ones in the conditional use permit. Times and flagmen and yeah, and those and those fees and yes. what have you, and those represent changes in um, city requirements. Okay. So the conditional use per permit can modify the ordinance. Okay, that's that's really my question. That's all I have. Kevin, going back to the two versions of the house, if they built, if somebody built a three thousand square foot house and had the space underneath, could they go back in and do whatever they wanted to? with that space underneath? Well, with plans and permits plans from and planning permits. and building, but yes, the short answer is yes. And it's it's pretty common and it's a great way to capture space. If you have a downhill, mostly downhill homes, but some of the uphill homes too. I mean, if you, you purchase a home and you go in the crawl space and discover there's a 20 foot ceiling, I mean, it makes a lot of sense to build down there. So we, we see quite a bit of that. Just a little further on that, it's been our practice that if it were a flat lot and it's a basement, we don't even count that towards the floor area threshold consideration because what it's you're looking at yeah. is the house above. And these hillside lots, um, we do count it towards the floor area threshold, but what uh, Mr. Moynihan is pre presenting to you is that from an architectural perspective, you're looking at a, a smaller house because you do not see what's underground. You don't see the mass. If if this were built as you said, if this were built as vacant space, and it came back to be filled in, then it would trigger that floor area threshold, and we would bring it back forward for a, a review. Okay. So, Gavin, on the you had a picture of. Um, one of the pages of the plan, which was the side view mm -hmm. with the with the hillside. Is and it then, this one here, or the right. other one? Right. Okay. And then there's there's a there's a um, another one in the set of plans. Oh, for the outdoor stairmaster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. There's there's a there's another one looking at it from the from the other side. What sheet is that on? That, I, I um, have it in front of me. A now. sheet. Um, a6.5. A6.5. That includes the, f I believe is including the fence that defines where the easement is, whereas this one does not include the fence. Yeah, right? correct. Okay. So, and, and this this A6.5 shows then that the fence is, the top of the fence is above the top of the, of the roof line. So what, I must, Assuming if this were to continue to the to the right and show the easement that it would show the same thing I mean, it seems like they would be the same from either side But I just want to make sure that I'm not making a, a bad assumption on that 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 top roof line of the fourth floor is below the top of the Yes of the fence that marks the easement. That's how I understand it. Is these, correct? Okay. These cutaways um, You have to look at which section of the house it's cut away from and on this side it's an elevation and the garage is actually staggered back. So you're seeing the front of the garage, the two doors and the entrance on the lowest level, and then those French doors on the highest level. Um, and those, they're actually staggered. The garage is further back from that. So we would have to, I mean, I can defer to the architect to see where, at, where it says number one at the fence, where that cross section was taken. Okay. And if Correct me if I'm wrong, Gavin, but the lowest point of the Elson court is four feet above the height of the roof, which would mean that that fence, the base of that fence, would have to be at least four feet above the roof line. Uh, that is sort of correct. That, that, the, <laughs> the measurements that I have in the staff report are at the intersection of the property lines, and this fence is in that easement. So this oh, okay. fence is, in my understanding, represented it's 28 feet away from the property line of the Elston house. So oh, the so fence is actually okay. It's down yeah, so much further down slope. Okay, it's down the property. So I'm glad you corrected that. Okay, we can we can come back with more questions for staff. But is that does that prepare us for the applicant's presentation? Yeah. Both of you. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Moore. Thank Martin. you. Okay, can that, will the applicant please step up to make their presentation? Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Stephen McMillan. I'm the architect, excuse me. <clears throat> can I also use the PowerPoint here somehow? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Just to give you some clarification on this fence, this is a rough, this is an accurate depiction of the fence. And so you can see how high above our roof line it is. And the property is behind it. I'll show you the site plan. The fence actually runs along this line. You follow the mouse. And then comes up this way, I believe. The private easement actually runs at this line. So you can see that the private easement actually really cuts into oh, okay. their property. And that's why we've got this rather odd pie shape here. Okay, so part, a part of the fence is back the fence is the constructed. I'm not sure what the basis of the fence construction were. The logic, I don't know what that was either exactly, other than to preserve privacy for the neighbors above. And that was something that was uh, recorded prior to uh, my client buying the property. And in fact, to his chagrin, he didn't know that this existed when he purchased it. But we have uh, worked with it. We've met with the neighbors. We've designed the home. Uh, to try to accommodate their concerns. We made it a point to design the home with a roof line below the previously approved elevation, and that's the four feet, because that Elston elevation that you're referencing is from the previous conditional use approval. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting a little worse. So I'd like to just sort of describe the evolution of this design. You can see it's an uh, odd shaped lot. And we've got this rear setback uh, easement, or what am I call, calling it? It's a, it's, a, it's a private easement, which is actually beyond the setback requirement. The 19 foot setback requirement is here, is this line here. It runs, okay. So you can see that the fence, this is the fence line, actually, it's actually on their property beyond this, the private easement in this spot. Comes across the top of the property. I think it's largely following the contours, just for ease of construction, if nothing else. And then the fence line comes down and comes up here. So there's a lot going on back here. And you can see these contour lines. These are one foot contours. And you get a sense from the uh, landscape plans and from the renderings how steep this really is. So I want to just sort of talk about how this evolved. Um, you know, we've, we're sort of hemmed in with side yard setbacks, uh, this rear easement, the slope of the lot. And then the other really mandated requirement is that the driveway cannot exceed 18% in slope. So with the requirement that we have a two-car garage, this is the absolute maximum that we're allowed, according to the DPW, to get a car into a garage. Uh, after meeting with Gavin and the planning staff several times, um, we originally had this whole structure right up at the back here, right up in line with this area here, which did create an image of a really large structure. And we fought them on that, but we understood their requirements. And so we moved the whole structure back. Uh, it's now a little more than six, I think it's seven feet between the back of this piece of roof. And it's actually a, retain, a head wall here and the face of the structure. So to get the garage in the space, to accommodate the slope of the driveway, uh, we were allowed to move the structure to the property line. Our original design actually had the structure, which 
was the wall at the property line, which is this line right here. And as a result of uh, DPW's comment that the no part of the house could overhang the property line, we moved the entire uh, studio and garage back and into the hillside. And you'll notice that <clears throat> there's, a, there's an angle of the, pro of the property line here. So while when Gavin references plus or minus a foot, it's actually the soffit above that's plus or minus a foot from the property line. And the actual structure of the wall is another two feet. So the soffit above that projects over the walls. Oh, so you have an overhang over the wall. Right. Okay. It's cantilevered, so to speak. Right. And that was originally over the property line. Got it. And that was not allowed, so we moved the whole structure back, and then we gave it a little extra just to avoid what we hoped would be any problems. And so that means that the soffit is plus or minus a foot at this point. But as the soffit runs back here, you know, it's, it becomes plus or minus five feet, and then the wall becomes plus or minus seven feet. Okay, and so then to address the whole issue of the square footage and what's underground and what's occupiable and conditioned, uh, my client had a request to get an elevator into the space. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, getting groceries and whatnot up from the ground level up to the kitchen and then to the, to the bedroom level, that's quite a haul. So that was another limitation that we had. We had to get an elevator into the space and the elevator needed to sort of land in the middle of the house so that it could come up to the second floor with adequate clearance above the shaft. So that mandated that we had to keep moving that elevator back and into the hillside. So that and, and the stairways that constitute the vertical circulation from the ground all the way to the second living level, that's really, you know, that, that's about 1,800 square feet, I think at least, just in vertical circulation. So those are the, thing, the drivers of what, you know, dictated the, the siting of the house. But I'm looking at this. It's, it's, is this 12 feet? Is that right? Um, the, the, the width of the driveway? Yeah, approximately, yeah. At the entrance, oh, where's my mouse? At the entrance, it's much wider. I'm oh, not, yeah, but once you get in there, you're. So, you're so there's enough clearance to turn right. and get in there. And we've curved. How about getting out? Getting out, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenging site in every respect. And, um, you know, backing up, depending on what kind of car. You know, if he's got his Delta 88, it might be one thing. If he's got his Kia, eh, it might be easier. But, um, you know, depending on which stall he parks in, it's possible to do a three-point back and drive out forwards. You know, so it's, it's a challenging site. And to make it any wider would just increase the excavation. I'm just, a, I'm just asking. I, yeah, that's okay. I can see that it's challenging. So this is the front elevation. <clears throat> and again, the plans, that, the plantings that are shown, are intended to mitigate the the bulk of the structure. We um, did a hip roof in these locations to try to reduce the sight lines. We reduced the pitch of the upper level roof to mitigate the sight lines from the uh, from above. Um, and this gives you just of what the landscaping would look like. Um, this is the terraced wall that you can see in the plan to try to soften the bulk of this retaining wall. And all of these plantings, my um, 
intent is that, you know, they're shown as shrubs, but in fact, according to the landscape uh, plan and legend, these are all going to be hanging plants that will ultimately fall over the wall and grow down the wall. And that's all the way along here, these, all of these. Uh, we've got some large plants here that will grow up to, to soften this mass. Um, this, while this structure is all stucco and this upper half is stucco, this is a cultured stone which the intent was to blend it in with the hillside, again to sort of marry it with the, with the rock that's existing there. Uh, this is that section you were asking about earlier and you can see how much of this space is actually underground. Gavin mentioned that the lower level goes all the way back here. That's true, but it's not like a full basement. It's really a breezeway and mostly stairs and an elevator. And that starts right about here. So this structure is, is a small studio above the garage. And really what we have here is a three bedroom house with a living room, a dining room, and then a studio sort of overflow apartment. My client has a, is a married, uh, my clients are married and they have two children. And so really, and when you go to look at, you know, this, this structure, it's really a two story house, if I may. And when you get up to this one, it's really a one story house. This is the third level, fourth level uh, with the bedrooms. And um, if you look at the section, this, I don't know if there is a section through there, but you'll see that this is actually, you know, as, as you can see here, the cut. And as that cut continues up, this is virtually, I mean, maybe it shows, you can see here, this is the cut. And as the cut continues up, before it starts to dive off where the pool is, this is virtually underground. It's just that we've excavated it out. We've excavated this out to have some, you know, outdoor space and pool. And so that as you come off the third level, the living level, I'm sorry, the bedroom level, you can step out to, you know, an outdoor area with the pool. And so you can see, I mean, from, from grade, it's it's like 13 feet so and this is only 12 feet above the grade so this is this is literally at the roof line if that makes any sense so onto the shading study which is a something that we did to try to mitigate um, one of the neighbors So we, we, one of the neighbors uh, across the street uh, took issue with the square footage um, and the, just the overall size of the house and its proximity to the property line. And, you know, it was a valid concern. And I thought it was, even though it was not required, we thought we should really look into this. So we um, did a shading study on the, uh, you know, March 22nd. June, August, and December 22nd. And we, with the existing construction or the proposed construction, and then we also did it with no construction. And even this modeling does not have the structures above that are behind the house, which are, if I go back to the, I don't want to keep making it very dizzy here, but you can see here. This is the fence, and then it, uh, it, it goes up at approximately one foot per foot. So, and then you've got the homes. So by the time you get up to here, it's another 20 feet above the back of the uh, lot. And so those shading studies didn't even take into account these structures because I didn't have the data on them and I. I didn't want to guess. 
So these shading studies, Uh, they show the, the, the structure that's proposed and um, the lot without a house. And on a lot of these months, particularly December, you can see that it's entirely in shade without a structure. And then when you have the structure, there's virtually, and I'm inclined to say no difference in the shading impact. And then if you factor in the fact that the structures above would project even more of a shadow, then I, I think that our home has no impact on the neighbors. Um, and in the view impact study, we did a similar similar exercise, which I don't know what that is. Here it is. We took a we took the. Um, Top of our roof, we took an elevation shot from these points straight off the horizon for the upper properties to see what impact our home would have. You can see here that there's none whatsoever. Uh, this one, it's difficult to see here, but actually our roof is directly in line with the roofs across Coronado downhill. So as you're looking into the horizon, you know, they're literally, virtually in line. And then uh, the other concern with the neighbor across the street was the impact that this structure would have on his view from his front yard. And so we uh, took a, um, a shot from what is his front yard, which is actually 11 or 12, 10 to 12 feet below street level. So to access his home, he has to drive over a driveway that's a bridge to get to his front door. And then he enters the front door and the bulk of the house views into the canyon. So to address his concern with us blocking his view from his front yard, we took a shot up. And you know you can see here that's mostly retaining wall. There's a 42 inch guardrail and then our house is almost completely obscured by it. And if there's a car parked there, which there normally is, you really can't see the house at all. So, you know, we're, we tried to uh, minimize any impacts and, and address any other concerns. That's the end of your presentation then? Okay, great. Um, any questions for the applicant at this point? No, no thank you. Okay, I, I think we're, we're going to move on to the public comments and we may have some follow-up questions you for much. you. Okay, the first person, uh, Roel Peters. Please come up and state your name and your address. My name is uh, Roel Peters, and I live in 152 uh, Coronado Avenue. Um, and I actually have a couple of handouts. Okay, please continue. Thank you, appreciate it. So um, 
First of all, I want to um, make the comment that uh, I take issue with some of the conclusions uh, specifically around uh, privacy and solar impact of the uh, uh, house across the street and the proposal that has been made. Um, since we do believe there is significant view impact or um, privacy impact as well as solar impact. Having said that, we as uh, owners of 152 Coronado are absolutely not opposed to having a new house being built there. Uh, when we actually bought the house, our house 10 years ago, we knew that that would be a possibility and uh, we went uh, to look at what are the approved plans and what is uh, common in the neighborhood and that's what we assumed that there always would come, uh, come a house that um, uh, across the street uh, from us. So in principle, um, that's, we have absolutely no issue in, some, in someone upgrading the neighborhood by buying a, or building a, a house there. However, the, the plans that had been proposed and had been approved um, contain a 19-foot setback from the property line as well as were roughly 3,000 square foot in size. Again, in principle, I have no issues with uh, building a larger home on that uh, home site as long as at that point the impact on the neighborhood is properly mitigated. Um, the, uh, it was mentioned that, well, the footprint would be about the same um, if you do 3,000 square foot, but you build another 1,800 square foot in the, in, the, uh, in the cellar. However, it's much different on such a steep hillside to try to squeeze 5,000 square foot on it compared to putting a 3,000 square foot uh, home on it. Specifically, the major concern that I want to put forward here is the look and feel from the street level and specifically from my house when you look at uh, the, the building uh, and specifically the garage and the studio. So if, uh, if I can just switch to one of the specific... Let's, let's take a look at this. So what I'm specifically talking about is this uh, uh, height that and this wall that is being uh, that is being projected here? Specifically, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. What, for example, the, so it's this, the size and the shape of what is being uh, shown here. Just to put this in context, what in nowhere on the plans is being shown is where is the actual street of Coronado. Nowhere on the plans do they show how the street runs here. And that actually the bottom of this structure is already 10 to 12 feet above street level. That's why I actually added a picture of how steep Coronado is there. And you can see, just to put it in context, the street post, uh, sorry, the lamp, you see that sign? That's already at about 10 feet high. That street post is about three foot from the street uh, edge. Now just imagine that you're going to put from street level basically a 35 foot high structure there. It's 10 to 12 foot that is going to be hill and then another 25 foot on top of that. And that is going to be constructed about 9 to 10, I got the number, about 9 to 13 feet from that street edge, straight up, over a width of 28 feet. In essence, you're creating a humongous wall at just uh, 10 feet from the, uh, from the street level. It has a massive appearance of bulk, and all along Coronado Avenue, there is no single structure that has such massive bulk, so close to the street. Within 100 yards from 151 Coronado, no single structure is built within 20 feet from the street edge, uphill or downhill. Nobody comes closer to the street edge than 20 feet. Furthermore, all uphill houses are able to maintain this front setback. Pushing this uh, front setback to, in essence, one foot is totally out of character with the neighborhood and is absolutely not what I was expecting when I purchased my home about 10 years ago, let alone putting then, allowing them to have a 28 foot height uh, exactly at that zero foot front setback. Concerns were raised by various neighbors and various uh, times across uh, in the process here, but always were dismissed out of hand by the architect. This is the design that my client has in mind. This is what we're going to propose. 
it was even brought up in the RDRC meeting in August 15 um, that one of the committee members mentioned, wouldn't you uh, be able to minimize the bulk of that garage studio? Again, no action was taken by uh, the applicant. I'm not here to say I don't want them to build there and I want to make major changes to this design. That's not what I'm here to do. I want to work with the applicant to figure out how can you minimize the impact that it has on the street and on my property specifically. How can we minimize that in a way that pretty much uh, sticks with your current design? After talking to, uh, to staff, and uh, I was basically able to say, well, instead of putting a studio on top of that garage, which really increases that height by an additional 15 feet on top of that garage, and which really only adds about 400, what is it, 446 square feet, if you eliminate that and you actually put a green roof on top of the garage to basically blend it more into the hillside, you're still going to have the protruding garage there. Um, I, 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 uh, I understand that, but at least we're going to have a hillside, a little bit of a protruding garage, and again, part of a hillside. I think this is a, a propo um, proposed mitigation that I'm putting forward to the Planning Commission, and that uh, I think it would mitigate the bulk, if not all, of, uh, of the neighborhood's concerns uh, when it comes to the bulk that the proposed plan is, uh, is introducing. And I think it's, quite frankly, a relatively minor adjustment uh, to the plans and a minor adjustment to the overall square footage of the house. And I so would like to um, uh, request that the Planning, Planning Commission, in its discretion, uh, consider that uh, the proposed mitigation. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Torres. So my name is Mike Torres. Um, I own the property at 162 Coronado, which is right one down from a well. Um, I totally agree with what he's saying about the, um, that wall being not at street level, but higher. Um, and my biggest thing is um, this is basically 64% bigger than the 3,000 square foot that was originally approved. And it's, it has no setback, which totally is, does, it doesn't go with the look and feel of that street. Um, and my other big thing is, even if they plant some kind of greenery on that wall, you have deer up there all over the place. That, that's going to be gone, like, in the first couple of months. It'll probably never come back. Um, and the other thing would be the privacy, because that house is going to look right down on, um, basically, our, our, our whole homes. And what I didn't agree with was that if you're, if you're on a downhill slope, you have to build your house on stilts. So you have this huge crawl space. So there's nothing you can do about that. You have, like I have like a 20 foot crawl space, it's just empty space and people say, why don't you fill it in? But if you're building uphill, why are you digging out all that dirt just so you can build later and leave a shell? I mean, why can't, why can't you build right on top of the hill, sorry, instead of um, digging out and carving out the hillside? That's, that's my biggest thing. So I would be happy if it was a 3,000 square foot house and back to the 19 foot setback because this, this, that wall is just too huge for that street. And plus the other thing is I'm not sure how sound that whole hillside is because I bought my house probably two and a half years ago and when I bought it it was red tagged because two of the piers were uh, coming down and I had to put in like major reinforcement just to get that fixed. So that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Doreen Del Corpio. Good evening. Doreen Del Carpio. I'm at 142 Coronado, um, which would be downhill from the proposed home. Um, I have some of the same concerns about this massive wall so close to the street and so high up. Um, one of the concerns that I've had that I did write in, I have not heard back from, is related to the construction itself. 
I'm not sure how long it will take to grade out the dirt or build the home. I do know that my neighbor had an eight month project that I endured and it was not the most pleasant thing to have to deal with, but my main concern is um, passage of vehicles. You know how the street is very narrow, especially on that particular stretch of Coronado. There are no parking on either side because it is so narrow. When you have a large UPS truck and another vehicle coming, oftentimes they can't even get past each other. Now you're talking about huge trucks, excavate equipment, and um, the ability for us to come and go. In particular, my husband had two strokes this summer, one of which was on a Friday. Excuse me. Emergency and vehicles would not have been able to get to him if they were in the process of building or excavating. And I want to know how we're going to avoid that situation. A fire truck could not come through if there was a fire in the neighborhood. The ambulances couldn't get through. And that is a huge concern. Thank you. First, I think it's Juno. Good evening. My name is Horst Jung. I live at 52 Coronado. I'm not directly affected by this construction site, but I live on the street. With all due respect to the applicant, to the architects, this is the absolutely wrong house for that particular site. It's ridiculous statement. We made. I thought San Carlos was done with the Mac Mansion approach to building. This is absurd. This is a 60 degree hill and you're taking out 2,900 cubic yards of dirt. Insanity. Second point. We're very concerned about the haul, the haul, hauling this dirt out. There's approximately 100 trucks of 30 yards. These are the large trucks. Coronado is a disaster. On Thursday, you might as well forget about it. The garbage goes, there's no way the trucks get by. They cannot get by each other. It's total madness. And the other concern is that when they're parking their truck there, to haul the dirt, there's no way you get by there, except a small car may get by. No truck, no UPS, no fire truck, nobody will get by. How long is that gonna last? at least three months. That's unacceptable to have that kind of haul for three months going on. It is totally unacceptable. It's a disaster in the making. And the planning commission should know better than that. We've been at this for years now. The Mac mansions are madness. Why do we do this over and over? For a lot like this, a 60 degree lot, and you're taking out 2,900 cubic yards. Sorry, gentlemen. Thank you. Jeff Sudo. I'll, I'll pass. I just have a couple questions. Yeah, we will need to have you step up to ask. If you're, if you're going to ask them in this forum, we, we need to, um, to have it part of the record, please. Thank you. My name is Jeff Suto. I live at 417 Windsor. Uh, the only questions I have are informational. Uh, what is the proposed time frame for the construction? And how and so what? How long do we think that'll last for the grading part? Okay. Could, could, could we just have you ask your questions, and then we'll ask the applicant to get up and address everyone's concerns? I see. I'm could we, sorry would that be that. okay if we did it that way? Oh, sure thing. Okay, so, and then that way he can step up. So to I just the was podium curious also. about how many trucks to expect. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone else that had a public comment question? Did, can you fill out one of the? Oh, you've got it right there. Perfect. If you could bring bring that up. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah. Please state your name and address. Hi, my name is Mark Gasparini. I live on 127 Coronado. And, and my only concerns, I think, have been mentioned before, but I'll mention them again. It's the excavation. It's not really the overall footprint. It's the excavation. I'm more concerned of the 2,000 square feet underground. Coronado is a very narrow street. Coronado is actually slipping. I don't know if you visited that site. Um, Coronado was slipping downhill. I've been there 10 years, and the downside of the street is slipping. Um, they did some minor excavation, someone mentioned to before, or minor reconstruction, and the street slipped even farther. So Coronado is a very narrow street. It's slipping downhill. Uh, I don't, we didn't have any more comments about people. I live, up, I live up on top of the hill, so I'm not terribly concerned, but people down below the hill, that street is slipping. And I'm, I'm not sure anybody did the impact on that street from um, all these heavy trucks and equipment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I think we'll ask have the applicant address these questions, or would staff like to address some of some of the points brought up by the the public first, or what would you like to do, Mr. Moynihan? I'll address the questions about grading. I had a conversation with, with our public works department. Um, typically, these would not grading would not go on for three months. Not significant grading. Sometimes they do a major cut and they come back later and do some cleanup. But the intention of grading is usually to get the trucks in and out in a short period of time. I don't have that time frame because it depends on weather and the time of the year they do the grading and, and things of that nature. But speaking with Don Gilbert in our public works department, he was, he was under the understanding that smaller trucks would be used for this type of work. They're usually in, I think, the 8 to 10 cubic yard capacity. These are the smaller dump trucks, not the big U-shaped haulers that you see on the freeway, but a truck that's about a third of that size, um, which is more appropriate for this type of location. The dirt haul route is a one-way street. It creates a one-way street, if you can see that they come in empty from one direction and leave full uh, another. The impacts on grading are always significant um, to residents in these neighborhoods with narrow streets and slopes. But what, what typically happens is they will do a cut into the hillside where the basically most likely where the driveway is going to go in. They'll do a cut into the hillside and provide an area where trucks can go. So an empty truck can fit into this siding, um, for lack of a better term, fill up and then leave. So while it's being filled after, of course, this will take a couple days to make this cut, but after it's created, they'll be able to pull into this, this um, alcove, fill the trucks, and then leave. So the period of time that they'd be blocking streets would be either pulling in empty or actually pulling out full. So we have a, a, a great ability to condition these types of activities. Public Works has been very vigilant about it, um, and they take quite seriously the necessity to keep the streets open for public safety vehicles um, and general traffic. So one of their requirements would have two flagmen minimum. Um, they would require as many flagmen as necessary to keep the street open for local, local tra uh, traffic. So that, I just wanted to update on the Public Works information that I had. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Would the applicant like to, to respond? <clears throat> uh, with respect to the grading, that is, of course, a construction issue um, that, of course, we're sensitive to. And we would never imply that we could use a 100 uh, cubic yard truck. I don't think one could even get up there. So we will be using smaller trucks. And as Gavin described, the process would be to cut out these areas and clear this area. Uh, shore, uh, either build the retaining walls or the shoring, so that this whole area would become the staging area for the work. So the traffic would not be impeded once we got the grading out of the way for the entry. Um, to answer the gentleman's question on time frame, uh, grading scheduling is largely uh, per the approval of the Department of Public Works, as I understand it, so you can't do it uh, during the winter season. And if you do do it on certain days, it's on a day-by-day -day basis, I believe. If there's dry weather predicted for the next couple of weeks, they may let you back on the site. <clears throat> we have a complete grading uh, erosion control plan that's done now. And uh, again, uh, so that's to answer the grading question. I don't know if there's any other question there. Uh, to address the concerns about the McMansion, this is a three-bedroom home with a kitchen, a dining room, and a living room. And then there's a uh, studio for 
a spillover of guests or other use. And that studio is really driven by the garage location. So again, just to go through the design process, this is all dictated by the site. It's a difficult site. And, but as you look at this thing, uh, you know, an elevation like this is very unforgiving. Nobody sees anything like this. You don't look at this wall like this. You don't look at this house like this. It's much more of a perspective view that you're going to impact something like this. And these shrubs and uh, vegetation, they're just schematic. They're going to grow up to be about, you know, 13 feet high. And so this whole wall, in, in conjunction with the material that we've chosen, will be, you know, hopefully largely obscured, and the deer will try to keep them away. But uh, we've done everything we could. This is a two-story two house that's set up on a hill. And all of the other square footage is really square footage to get to it. So. You know, the square footage is not really, uh, it's more shocking than, than the, the truth of it, in my opinion. Um, let's see, what other concerns? Uh, the shading study, we've gone through that. Um, we did an extensive analysis of that. Again, you can see the shading study only factored in the property, not the houses behind. And so, we're confident there would be no impact on the neighbor across the street. <clears throat> Is there another? Okay. Do you have some questions? Uh, Gavin, um, how do we deal with, um, as a city, emergency vehicles getting into? I, I assume that while this um, excavation is going on, at least initially, if not throughout the whole thing, Coronado becomes a one-way street. Yeah, and I'm probably not the right person. I'm, I'm Public Works is usually in, yeah, in charge of this. But um, when I spoke with Don Gilbert, he was very adamant of the requirement for a minimum of two flagmen. Um, they typically the trucking companies have a radio system that they use for dispatching the trucks. They can't queue up, even in a large neighborhood street with a big right away. The empty trucks don't queue up. They queue up an off-site somewhere. And then they're dispatched. The, the site that has the backhoe or the loader or the scraper on site will call and say they're ready for a truck. So an empty, a full truck leaves and another empty truck comes. So the, the goal is not to have a residential street, regardless of which one it is in San Carlos, backed up with empty or full trucks. So the idea would be that a truck would come um, and leave on some scheduled period of time when it was full, and the rest of the trucks would be queued up on some other arterial street in San Carlos or off site, maybe even outside of the city limits. And how do we um, deal with the first couple of days where you're making that cut and essentially the truck is there and people want to get around it? So, for example, while it's being filled up, if one of the residents comes up and, and tries to say, I want to get to my house, does the truck move out of the way and come back around? Or does the, I mean, how do, do, we, do we deal with that in any way? Um, or do we I, make the residents wait? Yeah, and it's, it's handled several different ways. I mean, sometimes you'll see construction even in town that have signs up that say there can be an X period of delay, three minutes, five minutes, whatever it is, to give people a heads up. Um, other times, you'll have the flag people that can, you know, work the vehicles around it. In this case, there are, there, are, there are homes that are impacted, obviously, right across the street, but there is ability for people to come and go from Coronado um, if there's a truck in, in front of that address on either you know, either route, especially when there aren't empty trucks filling up the street. Um, we have made a requirement in the conditional use permit for the applicants to give a warning prior to the start of grading, because we give this conditional use permit if it was approved tonight. Um, we don't know when grading or construction will start. So there be incumbent upon them to let the residents know along the grading and dirt hall route um, prior to the start of grading with a written letter to give people a heads up so people can make changes. Um, you'll also see that the times for grading are greatly reduced compared to general construction hours. I believe they're 9 to 4. Um, Public Works is only allowing grading from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., which is about three hours or four hours less than the general construction. That, that's dirt hall. What about the grading part before the truck gets there? What time does that start? 
It says dirt hauling between. Oh, that would go. Hours. Yeah, you're right. That's for dirt hauling. That would go back to normal, the normal construction hours. So you got the tractor out there at 8 a.m. Yeah. And they were out there after four, but the dirt just sits until the next day. Right, and probably if they have a full load, they're not going to continue to do excavation if there's no trucks available. So. Which doesn't block the street. That eight to nine slot doesn't block the street. Shouldn't. They're on site, right? Right. Okay, any, any other questions for the, the applicant or any follow-up to any of the public comment? Not for me. Okay, thank you. Okay, yes, please. I move that we close the public hearing. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Okay, discussion. Um, Scott, since this has been through review with RDRC, yeah. do you have any um, comments that you would like to provide to the rest of the commission to help us start off our conversation about this? Yeah, um, actually there there many of the concerns that were presented tonight were actually presented to um, RDRC. Um, the one significant one um, that that still bothers me a little bit is the um, that solid two-story wall on the studio garage and um, it was actually asked in the RDRC if um, that studio garage could be moved back towards the residence or whether it was really necessary to have that studio on top of the garage um, That's still a quandary in my mind. So in follow-up to that, was there any discussion about articulating that front face of the building so that it was not all? Yes, front? stepping it back somehow. Right. Um, there were there were a couple of different ideas. Um, uh, moving the entire structure back, um, that was um, suggested that that wouldn't be possible. Um, making it smaller, um, stepping back the top floor, I, it, there were all kinds of ideas. Um, beyond that, um, there was the, the same discussion about um, the view and the shading that was presented today uh, I'm not from my point of view I'm not sure that the, the the view or the shading is that has really that much of an impact on any of the other um, properties around there I um, I asked why the uh, time stopped at 2 o'clock based on the way the Sun came around at 2 o'clock the shading didn't impact anything after that time frame The hill shaded it. Yeah, the hill at that point, it, the, at that the time. hill shaded it. Yeah. I don't know. Do you have more questions other than than that? Yeah, there... I just kind of wanted to get a, a, a going in feeling for how it came out of R D R C and what your we and again we were. did have concerns about you know traffic on that street and I asked a question about whether there were planned improvements to Coronado and um, the answer was not in the near future or not to anyone's knowledge at this point um, it's a tough street I, I mean I drove down it it um, I, I can see how it's really difficult for the people who live there to get by um, it I can see it's going to be difficult to do this. I, I understand the, the concern for emergency vehicles. Um, I, I think uh, it's, it's going to have to be done extremely carefully and there's going to have to be a lot of um, concessions made to make sure that people have access to their homes and that emergency vehicles have access to it. So it's not going to be from my point of view something very simple where you just put a flagman at, at each end of the street 
I, I just see that as as um, not enough to um, allay the concerns of the residents that, that live there. I think it's going to have to take something a little bit more than that. That's why I was asking if you made Coronado a one-way street as part of this is happening or something as, as some idea to try and figure out how to, how to deal with this. Um, I don't know. Okay. So that would be something that would affect the, any terms of the conditional use permit, right? Anything having to do with, right? Okay. Okay. So maybe a good way for us to approach this is to break it down into the different pieces, um, which the, the first thing we follow the sequence of the staff report on page three we have starting with the residential design review and look at that separate from the yeah. um, the conditional use permit and the grading permit Will you guys be comfortable taking taking that approach and we'll just work through it that way absolutely yep. okay okay so from so um, from Commissioner Marsters I'm hearing the concern that was raised in the RDRC at of that solid about wall. About that, that, that solid wall, the studio and the garage. And there was, there were, I haven't heard any concerns about the, the bulk of the residence itself. Were there any I, concerns raised about that in, in I, RDRC? I think that um, the concerns that were raised about the residence were sort of that blank wall along the garage, around the, where the, that sort of faces the street, the first floor or two, um, the yes, retaining, that wall? retaining wall okay. and how that is softened with landscaping and um, though we discussed uh, that it needed to be softened I don't think we actually put any conditions in there that required it to be landscaped in such a way as to soften it okay so were there changes that the RDRC suggested to all, the conditional use permit that all, are reflected in the staff report or we did was make uh, we threw out ideas. We didn't actually make any changes okay. or anything like that in RDRC. But you approved the house? We approved sending it on to the Planning Commission. We were there for information well, you call only. call that kick in the can? Well, we, <laughs> no, that was how it came to us. We were, <laughs> we were there as a sounding board and not as an um, approving body. The study session approach. Yes. Uh, I've been there. I know how that works. Okay. But just why I'm bringing a lot of these things. Oh, up. yeah. Good. Okay. So if we, if, what information would we like to get from staff or applicant about options for, for this? Commissioner Sampalipa, where, where are you at on this? I, I personally don't have a problem at all with the way the thing's laid out, okay. nor do I have a problem with the garage and the wall and what have you. When you drive up there, you're already confined. I mean, the hill's right there. So now we have a nice rock wall instead of having a hill with a couple of broken down trees hanging over, which is what, what I saw today when I was there. And when I was there before, I had gone there a, a week ago. Um, so I, yeah, I understand the hauling issue. I understand conceptually understand the concern. I don't know how you but mitigate. You're fine, you're fine with I'm, the design. I'm fine. So if we, if yeah, I'm fine with Staying focused on the design, you're, you're okay Keep with breaking. that. I'm sorry, okay. you have this, the process. Okay. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think, and, and do I, you have any other comments to add, Commissioner I'm, I'm just bringing forth the, the um, RDRC's concern at, because I heard it again tonight about that um, solid wall there and um, maybe there's a, a way of softening that somehow other than um, having vines grow up the side of it um, I, I don't know how wide is the um, public right of way there between the street and the uh, studio garage. Is that seven feet, Gavin? Bet 
between the street and the studio garage? The unimproved right away, like the area for landscaping? Yes. I think it's around 8 or 10 feet. Eight, so, so it is 8 to 10 feet back. So looking at the picture here, 8 to 10 feet back, you're, you're probably already 10 feet or so, maybe even 15 feet up off the ground. And then, uh, I'm just talking here, the, the, there's a one foot setback. And when I went down around the corner, when I was looking at this, then probably the closest building is 20 feet away from the street, which this is probably closer to 10 feet away from the street. Am I right there, Gavin? That this, that the studio garage area is roughly 10 feet away from? From the improved right away from the asphalt? From the asphalt. Y yes, approximately. Approximately 10 feet. And the one I looked at that's down around the corner for one of the gentlemen that was here tonight, that's probably closer to 20 feet away from the asphalt. Yeah, what I'm using our, our GIS software, I just measured um, some of the homes on Coronado with the larger addresses on the uphill. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones I it said, I only mentioned ones with lesser setbacks because several of them have, uh, the, they meet their minimum setback, but there are, are three that range from five to 15 feet. And for the height of the home, all three of those would have um, a setback that was not, you know, was not the minimum 19 feet. But you have to add that with, with the unimproved right away. So it appears like uh, the five foot would appear to be 15 feet from the <coughs> asphalt. And so okay. the one you saw is likely has a 10 foot setback if it appears to be 20 feet from the improvements. Okay. okay. And I don't remember any of those as being more than a single story. Were there? No, those are the uphill homes that I'm referring to are multiple stories. They're multiple them, stories. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have, I have to say that I I've, am on the fence <laughs> on this. I I agree with Commissioner San Filippo that it's a very confined space just the way it is naturally right now, just because it's a very narrow street and because of the slope and the way the, the trees come out currently. Um, I, I find the, the street facing of, of both the garage studio and the house to be rather severe, but looking at the other homes in the area, there's a lot of big blank walls everywhere. I would go through with trees and bushes and plant them all over. But, you know, that's that's just me and apparently that's um, it's, it's not a requirement and apparently some people aren't, you know, that concerned about it visually. Um, it would be, some of the plants that are included in the landscaping plan are, are ones that, that won't grow that tall where that the largest wall is off to the side of the garage studio. Where the, with, with the terraced, there. with the terraced area. I would, I would like to have that discussion and say I think that we need to add a conditional, a condition in there that requires um, landscaping that that softens that area, to the satisfaction of the um, planning staff. Where, where, are, where are you talking about this? Right, right in here. Oh, right in where, the corner. Where it there. Okay, steps back. Yeah, yeah, yes. I see it. So I see it. That's, that's the that, terrace thing. That, right. Yeah. Okay. That I think. Um, I'm now, a lot sure. of those plants are grasses, which will never, they, you know, they have nice volume, they have a great feel to them, but they, they're not going to go up that high. And the, the trailing plants that come down, you know, I don't know how much experience the applicant has with that particular kind of trailing plant, but I've never seen it trail for very far um, when it's hanging over a wall in, in, in my experience. So, so it's, you know, it's, I would hope that the plant selection would would try to minimize the severity of of all of those retaining walls. Um, well, you have to have one where the gar where the garbage and mailbox and what have you is. You have to have them hanging because it's all concrete. 
Oh, right. Hey, well, uh, right. If, if no something's going to be right where the driveway is, and Unless yeah, there's, yeah there is no there is no soil there, right. clearly. Um, that's that's a lower wall, though. I think it's I think it's the other the other wall that then leads into the mass of the house. That that whole thing does have a even though the house is a, a two story house, it's sitting on top of another at least one story of a, a visible wall. And I can be closer to two stories of a visible yeah, wall. In, in, in some areas, especially leading up to the front door. So I, I, I think if there was, I like your suggestion, um, Commissioner Marster, to, to maybe re revisit the, the landscaping plan to, to uh, ameliorate the severity of, the, of that wall. And it's, it's great that it's stair-stepped back to be able to elevate the plants. And I realize that complicates then the maintenance of those, but it seems like perhaps some of those plants could could be small trees, um, bushes that grow to to tree height. I think you know tea trees. Um, there's, there, there's a lot of a lot of different options that uh, that would grow well. And definitely the the plant list is is great from a a, a water conservation point of view, and that that works out very nicely. But I think there's some other larger plants that. Do conserve water, but that might help to, to soften that. And maybe some of the same things that are in front of the garage studio, um, which would bring those same plants in. But a lot of those tend to be taller, which was a, a great idea to help to, to break up the mass of the lower part of the building with those plants. Maybe some of those plants can be repeated instead of so many of the grasses. Um, again, I know that's a, a subject of taste, but we're looking at what will make this this building work in this neighborhood? Um, and like I say, I'm on, I'm on the fence with the with with the bulk. I would I would love to see that the studio set back, either with just set back or with a balcony in in place of the bulk of the building um, for the studio level. So can can we? Um, uh, is it is it? okay for us to ask questions of the architect even though we've closed the public hearing to open it can we yes without opening it do we need to reopen the, it's not public comment it's, it's the not public comment right. we're actually asking for clarification okay oh and before we do that if if that if the studio garage were to be moved back let's say 10 feet and let's say there would be some way to leave the, the house where it is and push the studio garage back in so that now it wouldn't be that semi-detached because maybe there's some there's something that with being semi-detached makes it fit within the or zoning ordinance somehow or something. That's pretty much why they did what they did because they couldn't push it back. Or even step it back so that the top floor is pushed closer to the house but the bot the garage is actually where it is. I'm just thinking, you know, of questions so that when the architect gets up, he could talk to us. I know there was a reason that it got pushed away from the house. I'm just curious as to why all of that happened and why we're 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 in the position that we're in. I mean, if you really look at this elevation, I don't know how you could push that thing back. Well, I mean, yeah, I don't know either. Well, part part of the garage it includes the vestibule, the and the entry area, and so if that entry area was more underneath the house instead of being within the footprint of the studio garage and, and was in the footprint of the utility area, if it was possible to push that back further, then it, then it, well, our our issue with separating the two buildings had to do with how height is measured. So we okay. two separate buildings was appropriate. Um, and then there is a whole program for the size the garage needs to be and how to access um, into the house. You could consider the studio floor and apply other setbacks to that portion of that structure. So. For Technically, the, the garage is six feet away from the house for the reason uh, that it's considered a separate building at that point. Correct. 
and so is there a way that we could go around that and move it back closer because I imagine originally it was actually closer to the to the I mean we're, I'm trying to figure out a way to address the concerns of the residents having that so close to the to the street this well the six foot was from our building plan check engineer so we would um, not like to change that at this meeting okay um, but as I said the studio space could be set back from the street differently than the garage space of that building is set back and is it appropriate for us to ask the architect whether that could actually be done well I, I want to make sure I understand that so you've got the box where the cars go and you're going to take the top floor and move it this way 10 feet or whatever number of feet it has to go I, 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 think, I think it's only six you feet you can move it the, can the garage you? has to be a specific dimension right they, the car for the cars for the cars part. okay So are we, we're talking about shifting the whole studio, or are we just talking about moving the, the, the front face of it back? The whole studio, I think, right? I, either either way. Let's, what years, okay. Oh, okay. Let's, well, okay, I just wanted to make sure there, yeah. that there wasn't one or the other of those that was excluded no, as well, an option. Well, the six feet between the back of the studio wall has to re, uh, be retained as well. So the that six, set back okay. does not and, change. And the existing studio, actually, the back wall is the same as the back wall of the garage, isn't it? So right. if you change that top floor and move it back six feet, we've lost that six feet. We've lost the separation between the two buildings, if I understand you correctly. So we can't move that top six feet um, be, in either direction. We can't move it six feet because it's too, gonna because be too, it's, close, to it's too close to the main mm -hmm. house. Right. You, Unless we move the You could change, whole thing. It, yeah. although I'm, I imagine that, that um, Mr. McMillan will suggest that it's more expensive construction to do a floor plate on that studio that's different than the space below it. Yes. You could change any of those setbacks of that floor, except the back wall. It's you cannot wall, get it, which is of course the one we feet. want to change. Oh, we right. were under the impression you wanted to change the setback closest to the street. But that would push it closest or to the, make the closer to the, to the make the square footage smaller or make the square footage smaller right. okay I was trying not to do that I was trying to find a way to shift it closer to the house without but you can't do that without considering it a separate building and why do we have to have two separate buildings from a f uh, floor area to, to, for measuring the the, uh, the height of the roof. The height of the roof. Need okay. to be treated as two separate buildings for the. Otherwise, you go over the twenty. Okay, I'm right. getting. It Otherwise, now. you have to. Thank you. Have to count okay. The roof on the I'm, house I'm, from. Yeah, from the roof the all the way the down to the basement of the garage. Yes. Okay. Okay. That goes over the twenty foot height limit we have. Thank you for walking me through that. Okay, so what would staff suggest as our next step for where we are in this in this process? I I think there's a few questions probably we want to pose to Mr. McMillan um, and or the the property owner as far as which direction you know they're willing to discuss. I think two that that are clearly stated is regarding the landscape plan coming back and you could add that condition to number 11 um, which really has to do with our irrigation requirements but you could expand that condition for landscaping in general and what you'd like to see of soften the terraces and greater height of um, species including more trees and then um, regard I think 12 would be the appropriate condition um, where you've asked for the um, staging plan and how we address the narrow streets and that it, this is um, 
to be approved by the public works or the building department and that you might want to put in there that they consult with the safety agencies? And then regarding design, I, um, I believe you're still discussing that. And we'll let you know where that change ought to be when Actually, if you do want to change uh, any of the design program, then that would be condition one, which is that says strict conformance with the plans approved by the Planning Commission. So that would be as amended per your direction if you want to change any of the architectural program. Okay, so what I'm hearing you say is is that from the design review portion of what we're doing here, now we need to follow up with the applicant in this venue, right? Correct. You can okay. you could ask questions without opening the public hearing about what that would do to the architectural program. Okay. All right. So, yeah, would, would the applicant please step back up so that we can address some, some questions, the commission can address the questions to you. So you, you've heard us talking about the, the footprint of the, the studio and the garage. Um, and we actually did do a study, and I did bring it, and uh, the comment was could we move the studio portion back? And that really made the studio, which is already a pretty small space relatively speaking very narrow and really um, dysfunctional and it also created <clears throat> excuse me because of the um, requirement to have the garage and how its location is dictated it created a five we moved it back five feet it created an area out here which we would propose to be used as a occupiable terrace and uh, out of consideration for our neighbor's privacy issues, I am compelled to believe he would rather we not have an occupiable terrace as opposed to a, you know, there's no terrace at this face. It's just a uh, French, it's just a door that opens with a, with a wrought iron rail. So, <clears throat> and we did lay it out. I drew it, I brought it. And I did run it by the client, and they really like this design. It meets their program. It complies with all the requirements of the planning department. It replies with all the code requirements. And it created a, in this elevation, the whole thing starts to look, you know, a little wonky. As opposed to right now, it's nicely symmetric and, and organized and structured, and it makes sense. Um, you know, if that's what's required, then that's an option, but it really compromised this whole space and it created this outdoor area, which, you know, if, if privacy is a concern now, it might be a greater concern uh, if, if with that design. We did recognize the comments from the previous RCDC, but we understood that it wasn't required for approval and that we should take a look at it and do a study and I could certainly show that to you if you'd like okay uh, a question for for staff <coughs> Excuse me. I, I think it's a <coughs> it, is it appropriate without reopening public comment to be able to pose a question to a member of the public for them to re respond to no we have to reopen it okay I don't, I don't mind reopening. Okay. I, I just, I, I would actually like to hear those people who are that, present uh, to respond to. He, he was to, not here when that recommendation was made. He was not at the RCDC meetings. Right. You might not want to see that. So, um, okay. Do, I'm, are you okay? I'm, we'll I'm a happy camper. Would one of you like to make a motion to reopen the public? I move that we reopen the public hearing. I second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It passes. Okay. So um, I believe that would be 
would be Mr. Peters. Would would you be interested in in letting the commission know what your response would be to that kind of change in the design to the studio garage if it included a uh, a public terrace area on on the studio level? If, if you would please come up to the podium so that we can make sure this is part of the public record. Thank you. Um, anything that can be done to move that massive wall back, I think, um, is something that uh, we would consider. I can't say, yes, that would be awesome. I'm, I'm thrilled with the design uh, because of that. Um, I think it is important to consider, though, um, why can it not, instead of being a public space, why can't it be a planted, uh, planted area? Yeah, if uh, applicant is fine with moving it back five feet, uh, make that uh, an, an area that is planted in the same way as the rest of the hill. Um, it is already like the same way as the terracing of, on the retained wall with the steps and the planting according to that. Why is that not applied at the, in an area that's even closer to the street uh, straight up? So I, I think it's a step in the right direction, but if we're consistent with uh, what is being required from a, uh, the, all the other retaining walls, um, I would consider, uh, I would like to ask the Commission to uh, move, continue thinking in that same direction. And um, it, as I said, it's definitely a step in the right direction. Um, and, uh, but obviously everything depends on what ultimately is, uh, uh, is considered or proposed. Sorry. Thank you. Can I Did ask? the staff have any comment to make at this point in time? Do you have a question, Commissioner Marsters? I, I do. Um, I want to wait till there. Yes. We, we, we have um, balcony regulations for multifamily that requires them to be a certain width. I'm thinking it's three feet, it might be five. Um, but one might consider, and I don't want to be the architect, but um, the, the reverse of what's shown is a bumped out French door as an inserted French door, and then it has a balcony space where someone can actually stand there. Um, whether or not they do is another matter. So, but then you'd get articulation in rather than out to the street. And it would just be for the dimension that's got the, the wall that's got the French doors on it. Right, which, which that pops out what? It pops out two, two feet. Two feet. You so can, you're talking about you being reverse inset it that two feet. To pop it in, right, within a... Mm -hmm. long and but it's two feet wide yeah it, it, its length across the frontage of the building is 11 feet 9 inches so it, it would make a the opening is 11 feet or the whole the whole that length? whole pop out that has the doors in it is 11 feet 9 inches so let me make sure I'm, I'm following what you were saying so you're talking about the possibility of having it pop popping in the pop out in. <laughs> yeah. that's what it looks like and then having a space outside of it and I did you I'm not sure I recall how many what the minimum size of that was that you you're talking about multifamily being like three to five feet but what Right. Well, for a single family, we don't because, as proposed, with the um, oh, so French door that's just got the metal railing, you can probably count the number of ones that you've seen around town that look like that. If it's mm -hmm. more, if you want to create a greater articulation and actually have a space that looks like someone could use it, then I think our dimension is three feet. We could check, um, and then you could make your condition open enough that. We'd uh, check that. So there may or may not be a requirement for a minimum size 
for 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 a usable space, there is. For if it, you don't care whether it gets used, it's just an architectural feature, then there is no minimum size. Okay, so it's just a decorative. It, it, it's just an extension. So visually, when you're inside the room, there's a small space outside that continues out that makes the room feel like it's it's larger, but you, it's it's not large enough to actually use. It's like, I think I remember year or so ago, a project on the second floor over the garage. They had something like that. Okay. So I'm trying to understand this. So we, we currently have a bump out that for that little area. And so you want to bump it back in? No? I'm just saying you could. She's just giving <laughs> options. Sorry, sorry, what she sorry. wants. You're suggesting. Anything. She's saying it, this, is this is a possibility. A possibility. Okay. And articulation. You'd still want a roof over it. Um, what? I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that solves the problem either. It doesn't. I mean, the problem you guys are trying to solve. Well, it, it, in my mind, visually, that it does help to ameliorate the situation, to have it, have it pop back in rather than it being something that that's, that's coming out that that close to the to the street um, but I can also see that it throws off the the balance of the design because of the um, pop out over the over the, the pop out over the garage and and that and I can see where that would not be um, a desirable piece of the design of that room so I can I can understand that and Okay. Um, I I guess where I'm at right now, I won't speak for the rest of the the commission. We'll come back to that. But I I guess looking looking at the the various options for for usable space and the integrity of the design, that I I think the um, one of the the better solutions is this revisiting the landscape plan and the the size and shape of the of the types of plants long lasting plants hopefully that um, that would that are used both out between the street and the studio garage and then in the stair step terrace area and I think that will best integrate this this particular project with the surrounding area um, I think you're right. I so think that's that's what kind of where I'm at to share with with you guys. So what do you think, Commissioner I, Masters? I, I think you're absolutely right. I, instead of having low shrubs and grasses that you see between the street and the stone wall and the um, the studio up above, if there were an oak tree there, for example, or something that um, uh, obscured part of that um, and even part of the second floor um, that I think would change the whole look of that from the street and, and that particular rendering I believe is missing one of the existing trees is that is that correct that's correct. yeah there, there, there there's a tree oh, just you got the little plants here's the big plants yeah there is an existing yeah, oak. Yeah, there's a 13-inch tree there. It's on the left-hand side of the driveway, just before you get to the garage. Uh, okay. Although I do agree, I think that could be augmented. supplemented and complemented and augmented. Yes, with, with um, some other larger, some of which the what's in the plan. Some of those are larger, but I I, I would like to see some more additional large shrub type plants. Something along the line of a tea tree, no, although those tell. aren't. I couldn't disagree with you more. Okay. <laughs> I don't want because you you, you because don't want to have a I wall. Went, it of... was like this. I mean, this this thing was right on top of the road. So, by this I is... would suggest layering, where you've got little things, medium sized things, but having a big tree right on the side of a hill. I, first off, I don't know how well it would grow with that. Going, that's 
that's what you have right here. Well, they're cutting rid of some of that stuff. They're getting rid of the bigger I know, and that's I don't what, know where I, that is, to be honest with you. Yeah, I'm not sure either, but I the, the way this tree is sort of... Up. Well, that's what's going to happen. You're gonna, Because you're on a hill like this, the stuff's going to grow this direction. It depends on the selection of the tree, because the the oaks, when they're not uplimbed... Well, those are live oaks, right? I think you're right. And, and, and I'm guessing you're probably going to trim the existing trees into a, a more pleasing shape to get the look that you're seeing there where they would be uplimbed from the from the, the ground. I mean, usually you uplimb them, you know, six to eight feet so you have space from the ground up into the tree so you get some some trunk structure in there. What I've found, at least in the RDRC in the short time that I've been there, is that we try and use landscaping oh, to pretty much... Ticket, that's the ticket to heaven. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, to, to solve pretty much every problem that yep. arises but um, covering up c covering up with big big trees which create maintenance problems which create foundation issues which create which create problems with the side of the hill I mean you want things to protect from erosion so I don't know what I mean, I'm not a horticulturist mm -hmm. or whatever yeah. so I really don't know what they do for erosion but and we don't have to worry require, about big, that big problems what, what big, I would, big 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 right and I'm not suggesting big trees I'm just I'm suggesting something that that has and they'll also a grow to search, to it they'll search for light as well. So that means grass. they'll grow tall and thin. I, I've got a, a good idea? compromise here, which is that we're not landscaping experts. Well, that's why I and think so you guys so have the provision. What I would like to say yeah, is that I'm we okay just have the provision of, yeah. of landscaping to soften the, the same way we want to soften the, the other one. Okay, so... Given that we in, we include that in there, we're, we're saying Which that. We've done, right? That's been done. Well, we have to. It's on eleven. Right. That's number eleven. That was, but that we'll was where, we'll add the additional right. location. Okay. So, given that, Seven. then can we say that we all agree with the findings for the design review portion as? as identified on pages six and seven. And, and so the two conditions that we've talked about is um, for a condition uh, added to condition 11, updating the landscaping walls, um, and updating the landscaping plan so as to soften the front facing walls and, and that can be the, the front facing wall where of the garage and the studio and the front-facing wall of the um, the main structure itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Wait, hang on. The one thing that I don't want to open up a can of worms, but I will. Okay. When you look at this picture, I, I didn't notice it till I I didn't I was looking at the big plans all the time. I didn't look at this little one here, but this this white wall in the back is that that's the wall by the pool, I assume. This wall right oh, here, right that's a wall. Here. Yes, right, that's the painting could. wall behind the pool. And so that's what I was trying to figure out. What kind of, I don't see any landscaping behind that wall. Or hanging down from that wall. Do you, I, am I not seeing that right? Right. So to me, that would be a bigger problem than this one here. So, so <laughs> as that tree grows up, is, you can't see it. This this is how I, I, I wrote it. Um, uh, Modify condition 11 right. for updating landscaping so as to soften the front facing walls to the satisfaction front of the plan. Facing. Okay, so that'd be everything. Front, all the front facing walls. Okay. okay. So where the stone is, we, we, and we're not trying to cover up the stone completely, but we're trying to soften it somehow. Okay. Does that make sense? I, I heard an interest in the terraced areas as well. As the my assumption is that those terrace areas would be used for okay. increasing um, height of plants to soften the wall. Oh, but you're talking about the right here, the pool terrace. I think she's talking about these oh, three terrace, these, yeah, right. right in front of the garage. Yes, those two people so are standing. That there's three different areas that we're looking at softening with landscaping. Okay, and and uh, right. Yeah. But I, I'm okay what with is that. the third one? The, the third one is the, um, the, the big wall in the back by the pool. The wall that um, is, th is the base. Okay. So we're looking at. Right here. 
There's a big wall here. A wall here. There's a wall here. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm in, in my mind's eye. I'm not satisfied that that this rendering accurately it's shows that wall. Well, I was just looking at. It. That's why I pulled this. Thing. It, it goes. Rendering, sir. It goes. It's really pretty much in line with this tree. Pretty close, anyway. I, I think there's such a small part of that that wall that's maybe that's it's way visible. Overblown. Maybe that's just the way it looks. I, I'm not concerned about that right. that wall in the back. I, I think that, that if we say front. how that back part of the lot is landscaped is, is a challenge for every single house on that on that hill to be able to right. landscape the, your entire lot in that location. If we say possible. front facing walls, then we sort of cover all of Brilliant. that to the satisfaction of the planning staff. Okay, I, okay. I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. Then yeah. leave it to if staff. If they look at the tree and the tree looks fine, then they're fine. Okay, so that's the only condition we have related to the, the design no. review. There's a second Just related one. to the design review. Is there, is I the thought, I thought the, the second, the, we had to add to condition 12. Wasn't but that's that? For the, that's for the, the actual grading hall grading. Permit. That's not the design review portion. Okay, so that's I just want to make sure there's nothing else with design review. Nope. So, okay. Okay, so then, so then, for the, from a conditional use permit, what you're saying that we would then okay. change twelve, right? Yes. Okay, and that was to consult with with safety agencies. Okay, so with the addition of that, then I'm assuming unless I hear from, from either of you that, that we agree with the findings, the two findings for the conditional use permit. Um, so how, how does this one read? Something like overhaul. work with public works for on a staging plan um, for the narrow streets? Or how do, how do we word that? And then in addition to consulting with the safety agencies? I want to I want to make sure that we have an enhanced staging plan and that it's it, we don't we impact the residents that live there as little as possible. And I I, I feel like What's in that's there? what it says here is that a staging plan should address truck routes, staging of materials, delivery, and general parking and circulation of all construction related activities. And I would assume it, that when that 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 statement in any conditional use permit that we would see is specific to the location. Is that a correct interpretation or do we need to be more specific to focus on this location? So, well, you could add to the end of the second sentence because it's focused on the construction activity, but you also want to focus on neighborhood circulation, right? Yes. So you could add neighborhood circulation in the second sentence, and in the third sentence, you add consultation with safety agencies. Okay. I'm happy with that. Okay, that's that's good. Thank you. I, I think mm -hmm. that will address the concerns that the, the neighbors have. So. And that takes care of all the, the notes that you had in terms of yes. any suggestions? Okay. 14. Um, understand what they mean by issue. I mean, it seems like we've got this thing split up. 12 and 14 seems like they need to be together. But what, what's a city construction staging plan checklist? Does it have any of this stuff in it that we're talking about? It does, but the construction staging plan checklist is mostly for um, the ongoing construction after the grading is done, and whereas um, 12 is more of a public works um, staging plan for the delivery of the trucks. Two standard conditions, but the one on number 12 is really more to do with the truck deliveries and um, that shorter period of time frame, whereas uh, number 14 is ongoing and includes BMPs, breast management practices, and a variety of other things for handling the staging of equipment, material deliveries, and parking for employees, and all, all of those other things. Okay. So, in, any other comments, discussion? Not for me. It, it sounds like we've come to an agreement. Someone like to so make a motion? If you're ready for a motion, oh, can you, you we have, to do have a motion to close the 
public hearing again? Yeah. <laughs> we reopen it? Yes. Oh, we did? Oh, yes. yes. Um, I move we close the public hearing. Second. Again. All those in favor? Um, yes. Yes. Yes, would you please? Yeah, I'm not close. Re restate your name, please. Uh, please, in the microphone. Mike Torres. I just um, want to know the size of the studio. And the reason I'm asking is because what I'm hearing, it's a three-bedroom, two-bath house. And this is only for out-of-town guests. So it could be a lot smaller if it wasn't a permanent residence. So I just want to know the size of the studio. It's 446 feet. Okay. Thank you. It's pretty small. Okay. Okay. So all those in favor of closing Aye. public hearing? Aye. 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 Passes. Okay. Now moving on to... And, and I just want to comment on the um, uh, the letter that we received from um, oh. Arthea and Frederick Ball, and um, the uh, concerns of um, the stability of the hillside. Um, one of the conditions is a five hundred and sixty-two thousand dollar bond to make sure that um, the any problems that arise from the instability of the um, hillside are addressed and taken care of. So that is in place. So um, the concerns about the um, hillside should be addressed through that. I didn't interpret it that way. I, I interpreted the fact that they're taking all that dirt out. It's going to make it more unstable, regardless right. of the dirt and hauling permit. I assume that's what they're right. talking but, about. Right, but that's what the bond addresses for. During um, the process, during but after the process. the process is over with, right. the bond doesn't exist anymore. Right. It's, it's only for during the process. Okay. I don't, I don't know if that deals with uh, the, the their ball concerns, question. their long-term concerns. I think it's a long-term issue, not a short-term issue. Is that that's how I interpret it. Anyway. Is that something you think we need to address? Well, I assume that we're going to be doing general business standards, right? <laughs> Conditions, it's construction standards. Engineered Engineer, plan I mean, I, okay. that's required. Okay. So. Okay. In, in, any other questions, comments before we. On this? Oh. I, I actually have it. That's why I keep pointing to it. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so I just the, have so, a question. So the I, great, yeah, so grading in Dirt Hall. Yes, your right. question. Right. Um, in the condition permit, we have the times for hauling, but we don't have it in the actual uh, grading permit. Do we need to have it in there? Because I don't see it in here. It could be added in. Yeah, we have it under PW12. Yeah, those um, both those documents came from Public Works, and so it would be easy for us to add them into one of the conditions just to include that hours of 9 to 4. I, mean, for do, I would think we would need to put it in. I, I, don't, I don't want to put something we don't need to put in, but I'm just, just asking the question. I think that they don't. Public Works gave us, gives us those conditions. I think they just don't add them because they're used to the hours, and it's, you know, it's a right hand. But we, it certainly makes sense to put them in there. It's, no, what what are you saying don't the well, don't if you put in, If you look at PW12 uh, over right, here under the that. conditional use permit, it's about the dirt hauling hours, but it isn't over here on the grading and dirt haul permit. Oh, I okay. That's okay, because the grading hours reflect the construction hours, whereas the dirt hauling hours actually um, are different than right, the regular 94, construction. Right, which is what's in here, in the conditional use permit. Oh, it's different okay. Different construction so hours are eight to four or five, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah. And the dirt hauling is nine to four, but there's no mention there's of nothing. it in okay, the permit. Okay. Okay. So I was. And I'm just was wondering if you we were need to put it. If we don't, we don't. I, I just want to bring it up. I would think it would make sense okay. to do that. Okay, so we're going to add the hours to that. Okay. So that the PW12 needs to be added to the dirt draft grading and dirt hall permit approval. Otherwise, I have okay. no issues. Okay. That's. I'm. I'm done. Oh, those are all your comments. Okay, Commissioner Marsters, are so, you I'm done? Okay. So would one of you like to make a motion? I can do it if I can read it from here because I can't read it from there. Uh, um, 
I move that the Planning Commission approve the request of Alex and Natasha, and I cannot pronounce it, Chur. Somebody help me here. Chur. Can Thank you. Thank you. For the construction of a new 4946 square foot single family residence at 151 Coronado Avenue, APN 0491462600, with an associated conditional use permit and grading permit and dirt hauling permit approval certificate allowing 2,530 cubic yards of grading work, uh, both documents as um, amended. Second. Do we do we need to be specific about what was amended, or or just is staff comfortable with the what that includes? Hey, you could add um, to add the language as discussed by the planning commission for condition eleven and twelve of the conditional use permit, and to add um, PW number twelve um, to the grading and dirt hall permit approval certificate. All right, so as amended to include the language discussed in item 11 in the conditional use permit and, excuse me, 11 and 12 in the conditional use permit and the addition of PW12 to the draft grading and dirt hall permit approval certificate. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously from all three of us. There's a 10-day right of appeal. Okay, moving on to the agenda. To reports, correspondence, and general information. Uh, report on recent city council actions. Yes, um, the city council appointed Robert Hudson to a three-year term on the RDRC, and his first meeting was tonight. And bit right in. Yeah, did a very good job. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay, um, planning. Com oh, I, yes. can what you, size do you want to tell were? us what went on at the RDRC <laughs> tonight? Oh, oh. Yes, the next next okay. topic. Okay. Planning commission comments or reports. Uh, Commissioner Marsters. I have two uh, two items. Um, first, we um, approved the resident at one. Was it 124 Kelton, 125 Kelton um, at the RDRC? So um, unless there's a 10 day, unless there's an appeal of that, um, that project will be um, moving forward. So that's both houses have been approved. The sec, the first house you approved, and we approved the second house. Okay. Um, tonight and the second item that I'm going to talk about is um, I attended a community outreach workshop in San Mateo with uh, six other San Carlos uh, commissioners um, it was a community conversation on shared services and it was mainly an informational session but the idea is to over time um, hold more of these and to um, look at more ways that cities can share services amongst themselves. So um, I have a couple of pieces of information if anybody's interested in looking at that. When was that? What? When was it? What was it? That was not. That was um, the 13th, okay. six days ago. Okay. What is the status on the gateway design project? Or maybe you reported on that at the meeting that I was. Um, as that. far as I know, the uh, city council accepted the designs and are waiting for um, funding um, to materialize uh, before anything is moved forward on that. Okay. And that's it, I think. That's the, okay. Not a lot of detail there, but okay. No, that's I'm just thinking you could act out pictures of what they look like or something, but um, anyway. They, <laughs> somewhere they're available online um, because they, they had are. to be presented to oh. the city council. Yeah, they are available online. Is that something you could you could send me the link? Oh, sure. To that? Sure. I, I, I'm just curious. Yeah. 
especially now is when you drive in on um, industrial from Redwood City and where it We've got the San Car city of San Carlos, and it's just all dried weeds. It's a really nice dried floral arrangement mm -hmm. there. Okay, Any Commissioner San Filippo, anything? No. Okay. Um, I will be meeting with uh, the city manager Jeff Maltby this Wednesday morning. He's requested all of the commission chairs meet with him regarding upcoming activity kind of open-ended so I just wanted to let you know about that and also see if you have any input or anything you would like me to share with the city manager uh, no. Do either of you have, have no. anything okay all right I will let you know at the next meeting if they're gonna keep us or not no just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> correspondence none planning staff comments reports and updates of current projects Yes, um, you have in your packet a memo regarding the zoning ordinance update and we are preparing an another resolution and staff report for you to um, consider the August City Council public hearing draft the Economic Development Advisory Commission um, wanted to pass along some recommendations that furthered economic development and to the degree to which those also affect land use and since you are the land use of recommending authority we will bring it back to you on October 3rd we expect that it will go to the council about a month after that so this is postponing they were supposed to hear it next Monday and this right. is postponing that for EDEX recommendations to come to planning that's correct and then okay. a, as a result of that we've taken a look again um, we have a couple more little corrections so we'll see you on the third for work that in meeting. process yeah everything's yeah. a work in process a work in process okay okay then if there's nothing else okay this meeting is adjourned